Hi, my name is Bill Ham, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of Broadwell Property Group here in Atlanta, Georgia. Thanks for joining us today. I have been in the real estate business for about 17 years now, specialized in multifamily. I started off in 2005 with a duplex. So I come from the entrepreneurial side of the real estate world, not the corporate side. I've never had a position really other than the one I have now in the corporate part of real estate and commercial real estate. So I, I did everything on the entrepreneurial side. I started off with a duplex in 2005. I was a uh, commercial pilot by trade, flying airplanes. Uh, went out and, and closed my very first deal, which is a duplex. I had saved up $10,000. Uh, the duplex was cash flowing about 300 bucks a month and I walked away from the aviation career to go into real estate full time. Um, I certainly don't recommend that anyone listening to this uh, run out and quit your job and go into real estate full time. I was 28 years old at the time, um, you know, no debt, no children, no family. So it was pretty easy for me to do that. But uh, that's how I got here. And uh, ever since I've, I've built a very large real estate portfolio. Uh, and I'm vertically integrated and have created a management company as well. So today, what we're gonna talk about is due diligence. Now, first of all, I want you to understand there are lots of types of due diligence. We can talk about due diligence on a market. We can talk about due diligence on uh, the economy or a specific asset type, or we can talk about due diligence on financials that we may get from a realtor or a seller. It's all different types of due diligence. The due diligence we're gonna focus on today is what you more traditionally consider due diligence, and that's the period of time in which we get to go and vet a property. Um, this is from the, the point of signing the purchase and sale agreement and sort of after the purchase and sale agreement up until the due diligence window ends or what we call the look, uh, the, the due diligence uh, period, the look. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I've been in dozens and dozens of different larger commercial properties all the way down to small ones. So I've done due diligence hundreds of times over uh, for other people as a consultant. Uh, for my own property, so I'm relatively familiar with the process. Um, so again, this is going to take place from signing of the purchase and sale agreement. So we're, we're assuming you've, you've submitted your LOI, you've gotten your attorneys, everybody's kind of negotiated the contract, everybody's agreed to the document, you've now executed the document. Typically speaking, you have about three to five days in which to put up your earnest money. All right, and once that goes into uh, escrow, that's going to basically start your due diligence window. That's the time frame that you have to go out and look at this property, uh, vet the property, its physicality, its financials, the environmental, everything that you're going to do to make sure that the property is what the seller told you it is, right? And this is all uh, up to you and you've got to take responsibility for this to make sure the deal um, is, is a good deal and will pass uh, inspection with the bank and other things. Um, so this is what we call the due diligence period or the look. Uh, typically, as I said, it's about 30 days. Now that's up to you in your negotiation. Uh, if you are trying to make an offer more aggressive without increasing the price, Sometimes shortening the due diligence window is how you can make that offer a little more aggressive without um, raising the price. Because, and the reason, is once the due diligence window ends, the earnest money, the, the buyer's earnest money, now goes non-refundable. Meaning if the buyer does not close the deal, whatever earnest money is in escrow will be given to the seller as compensation for the buyer not closing the deal. There are certain carve outs that we can add in there, such as a financial contingency, basically saying, hey, uh, the due diligence window is for me checking out the property and all of those things. But outside of that, if the bank doesn't finance the deal, I get my earnest money back. So we're again, we're not talking about um, carve outs or any kind of clauses that are outside of the due diligence window. That's for you and your attorney to negotiate. We're gonna talk about that 30 days, 21 to 30 days that uh, you're gonna be checking out the property and what is it that you need to be doing. So again, we've signed the contract, earnest money's now gone into escrow and the clock is ticking. We have three things that you really wanna do in the function of due diligence. First of all, you have your physical due diligence, your financial due diligence, and your lease audit. Those are your three main points when you're going in to check out a property. So first point, your financial due diligence. Actually, let me back up. What I suggest when doing due diligence is that you try and do the quick and free due diligence first before you start committing funds and spending money. 
All right, so what is the free due diligence that we can do early on? Um, lease audit and financial uh, audits are the first thing you wanna do because they're the easiest and they're free. Right after that, you would probably wanna do your physical inspection. And those are kind of your first three things you do there. So uh, financial audit or financial due diligence. What I'm talking about there is you are gonna to wanna to get 12 months worth of bank statements or tax return, whatever clarifies or proves the financials that the seller has given you. So typically speaking, the seller or the realtor has given us what we call a T12 or a trailing 12. That's a month to month financial statement uh, on the property's operations extending back at least one year. Sometimes you might get it for two or three years, depending. But point being is that um, the seller has given us this set of financials and said, this is what the property did financially, income and expenses over the last year. We, we have to trust them up until due diligence, and now we're gonna verify that all that revenue is actually true. So that's where I say now to verify the books, you need either 12 bank statements that match each one of those months on the profit and loss, the trailing 12, or you need a tax return for that entity for the end of the year. Personally, I'd rather have bank statements than a tax return. Uh, bank statements are a little more granular. We can see each month. What I'm really looking for in that process is not so much to see the expenses or to see what went in and out of the bank account. I'm not as concerned with that at the moment. What I'm looking for is to verify that the seller did actually put the cash in the bank that they said they did. That's on that profit and loss that says, you know, this property collected this amount of money this year. I want to see that in that bank. I want to see it going in. Again, we'll check expenses later, but it's just about the revenue. We're verifying that the seller isn't lying about collections, more or less. You know, um, I've never actually encountered anybody doing that, so I would go as, as far as to say it's not very common. But you know, uh, books can be faked, and this is what due diligence is for. So again, I've never actually seen it, but you know, you always you always want to assume it could occur. So we're gonna pull 12 bank statements and what we're gonna do is we're gonna sit down and look at the profit and loss. We wanna say how much money went in and does that match that bank account and go uh, all the way across the board. I recommend possibly hiring an accountant or a bookkeeper or someone who does this for a living to actually audit those financials. When I first got started, I kind of did a lot of that stuff on my own, but I'm not the greatest at math nor accounting. So I learned quickly to uh, hire someone that was a professional in doing that. It's not that expensive and it's certainly worth the money uh, having them kind of audit the books for you. So that's the, the financial due diligence. Again, we can get that done pretty quickly, pretty easily with not a lot of cost. And so what you want to do is to hit all the free stuff first, because if we find something in the inexpensive due diligence that's gonna kill the deal, we would wanna find it earlier on than when we get into, say, the bank application and some of their due diligence, and that's where we actually start spending money and can, can spend some real money. I'll cover that in a minute. Um, so again, hit the free stuff first. Financial audit, great, we've done that. Bank statements, tax return, the money's real, it's all in there, okay, good. Now we move to the uh, lease audit. At this point in time, we're now physically showing up on the property, more than likely. Um, these days, the lease audit might be able to be done digitally. A lot of people, uh, my company as well, keeps all of their stuff uh, digitally in software. So in a lot of cases, it may be a function of getting a login or something like that to the property management software. If not, then they're gonna have to export that data out to you. And if they are super old school system, you may have to physically go to the property, literally open the file cabinet and literally pull out some leases and go through them. However, the, the information is given to you, you just have to go with that. But what we're doing here is a lease audit. All right, and what I'm saying is we're gonna try and make sure that all of the tenants that are currently living on this property, whether it be a commercial property or a multifamily, uh, you know, whatever it is you're dealing with, you've gotta make sure that the tenants are legitimate tenants. So I'm gonna kinda of come at this from the perspective of multifamily because that's more of what I do. But again, the concept is the same. You wanna apply this to any type of uh, real estate asset you're dealing with. So what I'm gonna do in a lease audit is I'm gonna sit down and again, if it's multifamily, I'm gonna go in and, and sample audit. So let's say there are 100 units uh, that we're dealing with here. I'm not gonna sit down and go through 100 different tenant files and verify every one of them. I'm probably gonna pull about 10 to 20%. So if there's 100 files, maybe I'll pull 20 of them. 
and we're going to audit those 20. All right. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to sit there and look at the rent roll for starters. All right. The rent roll is the, the ledger that shows all the tenants information, uh, what they should be paying in rent, what their deposit is, if they're late on the rent, when they moved in, when they're moving out, basic information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that rent roll that's provided to me by the seller or the management company, and I'm going to start pulling those files. And first thing I'm doing is I'm looking at the, the lease. Is the lease the, the same name as the rent roll? Same person? Yes. Okay. Is the rent the same? Right? Because the, the rent roll might be given to me saying the rent is one thing, but it's the actual lease that's really going to hold up in court if, if for some reason there's a dispute. So you have to verify, is the rent on that lease the actual amount of rent on the rent roll that we've used to analyze our deal? Yes, it is. Okay, great. You move on. Now you're just looking to make sure that everything is there. Does the lease, uh, is it signed? Does it actually have a signature on it? Um, and then we move to the application, the tenant's application. What you're looking for now is to make sure that the tenant was actually qualified to live on the property when they moved in. So in property management, in multifamily, we have what we call a corporate override. So sometimes a tenant comes in that does not necessarily match our leasing criteria. So for example, most leasing criteria, pretty standard leasing criteria, is about three times the rent in income, monthly income. So you have to have a job that shows income at about three times the monthly rent. Pretty simple. Uh, maybe no prior evictions, maybe no felonies, you know, things of that nature. And so what you're looking for, first of all, you have to kind of ask the property management company, what is their, their leasing criteria? So you want to ask that. And now what you're doing is you're looking at the application to make sure that this applicant did actually check those boxes. Because sometimes we have what we call, like I said, corporate override, where a tenant did not qualify per the standards. And for whatever reason, the property management company has decided to override that and allow the tenant to move in anyway. That's okay, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. It is only a bad thing if it becomes systemic, right? And so, again, what is rare, but I have actually seen this, and it's, again, on the rare side, but um, a seller whose operations are not normally very consistent and their, their vacancy might be high, and so right before they get ready to sell the property, they wind up just moving in a ton of people that may not necessarily be qualified tenants or may not be the greatest tenants. They move in a bunch of people, they show occupancy, they sell the property, and then those tenants move out on the next buyer and the next buyer's operations kind of go back to where it was in the beginning and they have a big surprise on their hands. So to avoid that, we do this lease audit. And that's what I'm saying. You really want to kind of go through the application to make sure the tenants are qualified to live there or at least the majority of them are. There's not a, a big block of them that look like they were just moved in to create occupancy. So that's uh, the lease audit. That's what the due diligence uh, part is for on the lease audit. Um, pretty straightforward there, nothing too crazy. Um, next, we're gonna wanna kinda go and do our physical due diligence, all right? So we've talked about financial. That's kinda making sure the revenue is actually real. Okay, now we've made sure the tenants are real. Now we wanna make sure that the property is real and it is what we think it is. You've probably done a property tour in your process of buying this deal. You've probably gone over there, you've probably met the realtor, walked around, maybe looked at the property, done a quick tour, but it's very unlikely that you've been through all of the units. That is of extreme importance, especially in the multifamily space or if you have tenants that are actual people living in there. Um, this is probably a little less concerning if you have, say, a commercial industrial warehouse or something that's you know, single uh, tenant retail. Not as concerning here, but if you have human tenants, this is of utmost importance. Walk every unit. I mean that walk every unit. I can't be more serious about that. Don't let the management company tell you, oh, this apartment has a big dog, so we can't go in there. Or, um, you know, this, this, is, this tenant doesn't like people coming in, so we can't go in that unit. Or the locks are changed, and I'm sorry, we don't have a key anymore. If that occurs in your due diligence, you need to tell that management company that you have a 24-hour notice, and you're going to come back and, and have that unit uh, open within 24 hours, or you're going to cancel the contract. And they can go talk to the owner about that themselves. All of a sudden, those doors magically get opened. But point being is your due diligence, uh, physical due diligence, is going to be an inspection of that property, well, starting with the units. And no matter how many units there are, you're going to want to walk every single unit. Because I guarantee you, it's the door you don't go in that's the one that was burned to the studs or uh, is mold all over the walls or, or who knows what. It's always a surprise. 
So make sure you absolutely go in every single unit. That's what we call the interior due diligence. Um, you can you can do this in several ways. One, the professional way would be to hire an inspector, uh, you know, a, a building inspector to go through all the units and create a report. That's the ideal scenario. Uh, I have staff uh, in my company that's trained in this and that um, you know are maintenance techs and have the skill set to go in and kind of tell me, at least at my level, uh, what's going on in the unit. So I use my own staff. I personally walk every unit that I ever buy and I bring my staff and we go through the entire building. Um, that's the interior. Now, when you're inside units, you're generally looking for uh, damage. Is there anything crazy going on? Does it look like anything's out of line? It, you know, is there any major repairs in there? Check your ceilings, look for leaks. Uh, you're gonna wanna be looking under the cabinets, looking at the plumbing in there. Do you see any water damage? How old are the appliances? How old is the water heater? Check your uh, panel box, looking to see how old is the electrical. So you're generally doing a due diligence excuse me, a due diligence on the inside of that unit. And again, if maintenance and physical plant is not your specialty, you're gonna wanna get some help. You're gonna wanna get somebody to, to go with you. But I still recommend as the buyer that you walk all your units, at least just to see what's going on on your property. It's, it's good for you. So again, we've walked all the units now, we've inspected everything, everything looks legitimate. Um, one of the big things that you're looking for here is to actually physically verify occupancy. This is one that I've caught. And, and so what I do when I'm walking properties is I just keep a notebook with me and I just mark down whether each unit, when I walk in the door, is occupied or not, right? Because sometimes people can skip out, sometimes people can move out, and the, and the management may not have actually recorded that occupancy or vacancy on the rent roll yet. And I have gone on properties where the rent roll is showing high occupancy. And I'm walking unit after unit after unit, and there's nobody living in there. They've moved, they've skipped out, and the management just never got around to updating the rent roll. So it was a very big surprise in occupancy. That can cause you a lot of issues with your lender. And that's a great way to wind up losing earnest money, right? Uh, so that's why I say that's what this due diligence is for, is to, to protect our earnest money. And because it goes non-refundable, remember, at the end of the due diligence window, meaning you, you know, you're you not gonna get it back if you don't close. So occupancy is a real big one to verify. Um, just look for general condition. Does anything look weird? You know, Whatever you can think of, look through there. Um, on the exterior, we're looking at roofs. We're looking at the physical condition of the property, the exterior. Do we see a lot of wood rot? Do we see a lot of deferred maintenance, damage, mold, anything of this nature? You're kind of getting an estimate of what it's gonna to cost to uh, take care or update the property, right? If you have renovation plans and you're maybe wanting to upgrade units, now's a good time to really make sure that upgrade model is uh, in budget and, and is what you think it is. Um, look for anything that we call life safety. The reason you're really looking for life safety issues other than their dangerous hazards on the property is that's gonna trigger your lender to cause you to have to come in and fix stuff. So uh, know that if you see trip hazards, such as the sidewalks, you know, if the sidewalk uh, joints have started to separate, lenders, especially agency debt, probably gonna make you grind those down. If your parking lot's in bad shape, you know, you got a lot of craters out there in the parking lot, probably gonna be redoing your parking lot. If your roofs are super old, uh, you might need to replace roofs. Lenders probably going to make you escrow and, and replace that stuff. Um, wood rot, uh, any kind of electrical issues uh, that could be dangerous, anything like that. We call that uh, life hazard or safety, life safety. So look for a, a porches, balconies, anything like that that might have deterioration. Those are all areas that a, a lender is going to make you focus on day one. Um, when I go inside a unit, uh, I'm looking at electrical, look for uh, what we call the GFCI outlets, ground fault, GFI outlets, ground fault indicator outlets, the ones with little buttons on them. Make sure those GFCI outlets are in the kitchens and bathrooms. Um, look for smoke detectors. Look for all of that kind of stuff falls into the life safety category. And if the property doesn't have those things, especially properties that were, were built many years ago, if you're looking at something maybe built in the 1960s or the 1970s, may not have been updated over the years. That's something either your insurance company or your lender is very likely to make you do uh, very close to post-closing or maybe even before closing if they make the seller do it. So these are just things you wanna be looking for, kind of budgeting for so you don't get a financial surprise later on down the road. So that's our physical due diligence. We've gone through all the units. We're looking at all the stuff, the plumbing, checking everything out. We've brought our inspector with us. 
Um, they're going to maybe go up under the buildings, look at the structure, make sure there's no moisture or wood rot, termites, mold, things like that under the building. Um, that's largely what's going on. You are going to be inside the office doing the financial audit and the lease audit, going through those things uh, and, and checking that entire property out. But that's due diligence largely. I mean, that, that's what we're doing in that, that period from the purchase and sale agreement, right? Remember, that's when the, uh, the period begins, our due diligence, or what we call the look. I don't think I said that, I call that the look. So your look starts uh, you know, at the signing of the purchase and sale agreement, or more correctly, when you actually place the artist money uh, into escrow. Um, you should be receiving all of your financial information or should have already received all the financial information from the seller that you're going to need to do due diligence. So that's going to be things like uh, your financial statements, as we mentioned, bank statements, tax returns, things of that nature. Um, also, I, I haven't mentioned you're going to want to do diligence on do due diligence on any contracts that the property may have. So that's something that your attorney should be putting into the purchase and sale agreement. So that's really on your attorney side. But in due diligence, you're going to want to have access to all of the property's uh, contract services, service contracts, whether it's pest control, trash, uh, you know, landscaping, anything that has a contract that you're going to have to honor after closing. Make sure that you get that and you receive that prior to your due diligence window. You don't want to wait until uh, due diligence is almost up and then have the seller hand you all the paperwork and tell you to hurry up and go through it. So you, you receive all that prior to due diligence. Um, again, check with your attorney on, on creating a list of things. They can help you out with that. But it's going to be service contracts and, uh, and agreements. All right, so we get all that. Uh, we've now signed the purchase and sale agreement. We've put our money into escrow. The clock is ticking. Okay, now we have typically 30 days, maybe 21 days. You know, again, that's negotiable uh, to get in there, check this property out, make sure it is what the seller has said it is. We start off and do our cheap stuff first, right? So that's kind of doing the the lease audit. If you're doing it yourself, or you're, you're going to have somebody go in, sit down, look at all the leases, check all that out. That's quick and easy. Um, physical inspection. Again, if you're doing it with your own people, it's probably relatively free. If you're hiring an inspector, um, it should not be more than a couple hundred bucks a unit. So it's, it's not a huge expense, but it is money. And then uh, we're going to move to the uh, physical inspection, lease audit, and financial. That's the last one. You're going to sit down and make sure you do that financial audit. Do all of those things. All right. Once you've done all of that kind of due diligence, you are basically done with what you have to do. There is another round of due diligence, but it is now basically for the bank to do. All right, and I'm gonna kind of cover this briefly, even though it's not something that you're personally gonna be involved in, you need to understand what's about to occur and how the process works. So once we're done with all the due diligence that we've been talking about that we do, now you're gonna apply for the bank loan, right? You're gonna go and make your bank application. You're gonna actually put cash down. Now, this is important. This is why I say that we get all that other due diligence done first, because once you give the bank the application money, they're going to spend it, right? They're going to spend it on what we call the thirds or the third party reports. All right. So the bank is now going to do their due diligence and that costs money. So that's why I say try and do yours first. If all that passes bank application uh, and now they're going to go and hire an appraiser and they're going to hire a physical engineer and uh, a, an environmental specialist uh, or uh, yeah, environmental agency to come out and do the soil sample. So those are your third party reports or your thirds, phase one environmental inspection, uh, an appraisal, and what we call a PSA or a physical needs assessment. And that's done by the engineer. So those are your third party reports. And that bank is gonna take your application money, pay these three individuals or these three groups. They're gonna come out. They're now gonna do their due diligence on the property. Uh, and then turn this information into your, your lender. And your lender is then gonna kind of create some other stuff from that. So that's the second phase of due diligence. Ideally, you get your due diligence done very quickly and get these third party reports in there or inspectors in there uh, you know, very shortly afterwards. Something to keep in mind, kind of a side tip here, is that as the market becomes more uh, heated and there's more transactions going on in the market, it, appraisers and inspectors and these contractors can get delayed. 
So keep in mind that sometimes these inspections on the lender side can take weeks on end and you kind of need to keep that in mind with your contract time frame. You don't want your lender to kind of uh, not get their work done and then push you outside of your contract date. That could be bad. So again, try and get your due diligence done as quick as possible and then let's line up the bank loan because they're going to need to get in there and do that as well and that could take uh, some weeks to get that done. So again, they're going to send out the appraiser. The appraiser is going to come out and do a general appraisal, right? They're going to come out, they're going to look at the income of the property and do an income approach. They're going to look at comparable sale data in the market and they're going to do a replacement cost approach. And they're going to take all three of those valuations, blend them together and create the appraisal, all right? That's going to the bank. Okay, then they're going to send out the uh, environmental agency and environmental ins or inspectors. They're going to come out and do a phase one environmental inspection. That's normally just kind of looking around the property, looking at what's adjacent to the property, looking to see if there are um, maybe dry cleaners or gas stations or storage units or anything that may uh, potentially cause some kind of chemical leak onto your property. Uh, there are some, some different types of companies and uh, uh, industries that will flag that, such as oil, gas, storage, dry cleaner, things like that that are kind of chemical based. So if you see any of those around the property, that's going to be a little bit of a red flag, but that's part of the phase one. That's what they're doing. Then they're probably going to take a few small soil samples around the property just to check for chemical contaminants, just to make sure that you know, there hasn't been some kind of seepage onto the property. Um, and then you have your physical needs inspector. That's your engineer. The engineer is going to be the one that comes out and actually goes in a sample of the units. That person is going to be looking at the physical condition of the property and they are there to basically protect the bank, right? So they're coming in there with a sharp pencil, looking at all the different things saying, what condition is this property in? Is it in good shape, bad shape? Is the plumbing old or the roofs old? What about the parking lot? What about the electrical? All this stuff. And they're going to create a list, a, a sort of a to-do list, if you will, for the bank and kind of stating the condition of the property. That document's going over to the lender's office. The lender's going to sit down and take that and then create your escrows, create your, your physical escrows. So they're going to say, okay, hey, Bill, if you want to buy this property, our engineer says you need boom, 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 boom. And that is this amount of money. So go ahead and put that in escrow at closing. That's how our escrows are created is from that physical uh, engineer. So again, the third party reports from your bank, once you get to that level, our uh, physical engineer come and check the property. We've got your environmental inspection, gonna come out and do a phase one and uh, the appraiser coming out to um, check out the value of the property and assign a value. So that's the bank inspection. That's what banks are doing on the third party due diligence. And that kind of comes after your due diligence after you've, you've done all your quick, cheap stuff. So that is, uh, in effect, the due diligence process. I hope that helps, every, helps everybody out there. I hope you uh, are, are understand the process a little bit better now as you're going out and looking at deals. Um, again, just a quick recap, your due diligence period is the time frame after your, your purchase and sales executed, earnest money goes to the bank, um, usually about 21 to 30 days, going to be inspecting the property, do your first stuff uh, cheap and easy, do that stuff first, physical inspection, um, your unit walks, do your lease audit, do your bank inspection on the financials, that stuff's done pretty quick and easy, get that out of the way. Now we apply for the bank. Uh, with our bank loan, that could be you know 10 grand up to 50, 60 grand, depending on the size of the deal, really, um, and, or more, depending. And they're going to send out their third-party inspections. That's going to be your environmental inspection, phase one, uh, your appraisal, and your physical needs assessment. They're going to put all those documents together, send them to the bank, and the bank is going to create your loan. Once your due diligence window is over, again, the 30 days has passed, your earnest money typically becomes non-refundable and you're committed to the deal. And so now you need to close it. So that's the due diligence process, uh, kind of start to finish. Um, I hope that helps everybody out there. Again, my name is Bill Ham. I'm uh, with Broadwell Property Group, and that's uh, broadwellpropertygroup.com. If anybody's looking for uh, more information, you'd like to reach out to me, you can reach out to me uh, from the website. Take care.